order, we come now to a point of order, Diana Johnson. I would seek the guidance, Mr Speaker, on the written ministerial statement laid today by the Ministry of Defence around um, the national security through technology, technology equipment and support for the UK Defence and Security White Paper, and also in light of the reference which was made in Prime Minister's questions to the BAE news around the loss of the typhoon order to India. Um, is it possible for a Defence Minister to come to the House to address both of these issues as they are of such importance to many uh, members of Parliament and their constituents? Well, as the Honourable Lady knows, the manner in which the Government makes statements is a matter for the Treasury bench, and specifically the question of whether it is a written or an oral statement is a judgment for them to make. But the point of order that the Honourable Lady has raised will have been heard on the Treasury bench and doubtless will be transmitted to the Leader of the House and his Deputy. Moreover, the Honourable Lady is an assiduous attender at question time each day and she will be conscious that tomorrow is business questions where she may choose to make an appearance in an attempt further to pursue this point. Why they put everybody through the anxiety of, re of putting a fee on no, I haven't really said anything on the Child Support Agency yet, so I think the Honourable Lady, if she could just be patient, if she could just be patient, if the Honourable Lady... Let me just make it clear. It's very clear at the moment that the Shadow Minister is not giving way. On the government side, in my time in the chair since 5.30, there was a preference on the whole not to give way to members from the other side, and that is now being replicated by the... Honourable Lady from the Opposition Front Bench. Members can make what they like of it. There's nothing disorderly about it, and it's no good people yelling from a sedentary position when they're expressing their frustrations. They must try to contain those frustrations, which the Honourable Lady for Devises I now see is very successfully doing. Anne Maguire. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, for your wise words. We welcome the reduction that the Honourable uh, Lady announced today, and indeed, just for the record, we also, re we also welcomed in another House the additional funding of £20 million that was going to be put in to encourage people to come to... Point of order and a subri. I'm very grateful, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, could you help me in this way, please? Um, if a member of this House asks a question to the whole House, how does one respond to that question other than by asking that person to give way to answer the question that's been asked to the whole House? Uh, the Honourable Lady is asking me to speculate about a hypothetical. We could probably have a seminar about the matter. It might be instructive. There could be a time, but it isn't now. And I feel sure that the Honourable Lady has just raised not a point of order, but a point of disappointment. Point of order, Mary Cray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, we look forward to debating the Water Industry Financial Assistance Bill, which um, will be tabled by uh, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs today. Certainly, it would be good to finally have some government business to discuss. But, Mr Speaker, um, can you advise me, is it normal when a bill is introduced outside of the legislative programme, as this one has been, for the opposition to discover its existence through leaks that emerge from the other place? And can you further advise, is it normal for a Secretary of State, when approached by her opposite number, to state, I'm not speaking to you, I don't have to speak to you? Which was the response of the Environment Secretary oh when I approached her yesterday? I'm not sure if she was feeling a little out of her depth. Um, when I informed the Environment Secretary's office that I would raise a point of order on this lack of the usual courtesies at 6.15 last night, 20 minutes later, I received an email from her which finally informed me of the Bill's presentation in the House now. Can I ask you, Mr Speaker, to use your good offices and the usual channels to ensure that any future yeah, urgent yeah, business, yeah, yeah, yeah. the opposition is kept fully informed and the Government doesn't just drip-feed the information yeah. to us? Well, I say a number of things to the Honourable Lady. First of all, I think on the whole it's probably unwise for the Chair to rule on the matter of normality which the Honourable Lady raised early in her point of order. I shall eschew any temptation to say anything about that. Secondly, she has regaled the House with a racy and intoxicating account <laughs> of the recent sequence of events which apparently perturbs her, but about which I don't think any further comment from me is either necessary or helpful. Thirdly, however, what I would say, of course I'll happily hear the Honourable Gentleman, I didn't know he was seeking to come in, but he'll have his opportunity in a moment. What I would say to the Honourable Lady, is that the way in which this matter has been handled on the face of it at this stage is not a matter for the Chair. All I can do 
and must do is to ensure that proper notice is given to the House, and it has been. The rest of the matters may continue to be unsatisfactory in the mind of the Honourable Lady, but she has given eloquent expression to her dissatisfaction. Mr Richard Bennion, further to that point of order. Mr Speaker, I just wanted to get on record that uh, the Secretary of State has written to the opposition spokesperson, and, uh, as well as the Chair of the EFRA Select Committee and the devolved ministers, which I believe is the normal courtesy in these matters. We're very keen to work with all sides of the House to make sure that legislation is taken through uh, in as much a consensual way as possible and look forward to working with you and all sides of the House to make sure that this happens. I'm most grateful to the Minister for what he said. Two sides of this have been heard and I think we'll leave it there for today. Point of order, Mr David Watts. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, is it in order for the Minister to put up a, a spokesman further to the, uh, the age in question that obviously didn't know the answers to the questions that members were putting him when the minister who does know the answers to the question was sitting next to him. <laughs> <laughs> who the government puts up on a matter of this kind is a matter for the government. And as to the content of answers, whether it impresses the honourable gentleman or not, what the quality might be thought to be, this is very murky territory. And certainly it's murky territory for the Speaker, so I shall keep away from it. I don't think the Honourable Gentleman was really expecting an answer. I think he simply wanted to give vent to his views, and that he's done. Point of order, Mr Chris Bryant. Thank you very much. Uh, you will know, Mr Speaker, that on previous occasions, previous Speakers have ruled that when a Minister relies on a document for their argument, they are then required to publish it to the House. Now, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury earlier referred to documents that he himself had signed, um, surely he should be publishing those for the House. I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. My understanding of the position on that point, the question of reliance upon a document and consequent publication, is that that applies where state papers are concerned. Whether it applies in this particular context, I am not at all sure. I don't advance a strong view on the point. I think the Honourable Gentleman is seeking to rev up a point that he made, or simply to repeat, no. a point that was made <laughs> earlier. Well, he professes his innocence. He says it's a new point. Well, even if it's a new point, it's a point that's been clearly made and it has been heard. I won't rule on it because I don't think it is at this stage a matter for the chair to rule on. But the Leader of the House will have heard it and I've got a sh pretty strong sense that it will percolate through to the relevant ministers. If the Honourable Gentleman is still dissatisfied, knowing him for the sort of upmarket terrier that he is, I feel sure <laughs> that he will raise the matter again <laughs> at the earliest opportunity. And in case the Honourable Gentleman is going to ask me, as he did the other day when I paid him a compliment, he said, is that a compliment? And I assured him it was. It was. We'll leave it there. Order. On a point of order, colleagues will be accommodated, patients will be rewarded. On a point of order relating to the code of conduct on which no further points of order may arise, I call Mr Mark Simmons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Speaker, it has been brought to my attention that on the 31st of January and the 16th of March 2011, I inadvertently omitted to draw the House's attention to my entry in the Register of Members' Interests relating to strategic advice that I provide to a social enterprise health care provider. I would like to take this opportunity to both correct the record and to apologise to the House. Yeah, yeah. I'm just grateful to the Honourable Gentleman. And point of order, Mr Ian Wright. You, uh, Mr Speaker, you may have seen reports last week that an official from the Office for Nuclear Regulation whilst on a conference in India lost a memory stick containing information and plans relating to Hartlepool Nuclear Power Station. I have yet to be informed of this by the Government, uh, Mr Speaker. Going back many years, Ministers, when faced with data loss, have come to this House to answer questions and explain their actions. Given this precedence, and given the importance, the paramount importance to secure and safeguard our civil nuclear industry, is it in order that the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change has chosen not to inform me or to come to this House? And what powers do you have, sir, to ensure that I can receive notification and provide reassurances to my constituents on this very important breach of data? 
matter for ministers to make statements as and when they judge appropriate if policy options or announcements are due. From what the Honourable Gentleman has said so far, it is not immediately obvious to me that there is any matter of order on which the Chair need rule, but the Honourable Gentleman's words are on the record, and I shall take particular pleasure in observing them for a second time when I read the official report. If I have any further thoughts on the matter at that point, the Honourable Gentleman will be the first to hear. Meanwhile, his constituents will know of what he has said. Point of order, Mr Angus Robertson. As you'll be aware, the Scotland Bill is still making its way uh, through Parliament. Uh, last week, uh, the Prime Minister made a visit to Scotland uh, where he announced that he is now in favour of more devolution and that his proposal is on the table. Uh, given that the UK Government repeatedly says that a lack of detail about constitutional change causes uncertainty, could you confirm whether Ministers have sought to make a statement about any changes to the Scotland Bill? I can confirm that they have not, and if I were a more cynical fellow than I am, I might be tempted to conclude that the Honourable Gentleman was seeking to dress up in the language of constitutionalism an important point, a fundamental point, and for him an urgent point that was nevertheless overwhelmingly a political point. But as I'm not so cynical, I won't so conclude. <coughs> Order, I'm sorry to disappoint colleagues, but as usual, health questions have been heavily oversubscribed. And the House is in high spirits, and it's only Tuesday afternoon. Uh, point of order, Sir Gerald Kaufman. Uh, Mr Speaker, I wish to raise with you an issue which goes to the heart of the rights of honourable members of this House, <coughs> whether they have been elected here 11 times and, and are in their 42nd year, or whether they came into this House for the first time at the last election. The greatest right that honourable members of this House uh, has, have is freedom of speech within the rules of order. On that basis, I went into the table office before questions yesterday to table a question, uh, table an early day motion relating to the maltreatment and mistreatment of a constituent of mine. I discussed it with the clerk to whom I handed it and he told me that it would be printed today unless I heard from him meanwhile. Not having heard from him meanwhile, I assumed that it would be printed, but when I uh, looked at the list of early motions, it was not there. After, with some difficulty, I then got into contact with the table office and a, a representative whom, of whom told me that the early day motion was still being examined to see whether it was in order. They had seven and a half hours yesterday and they had six hours today to look into it. They had discussed with me the basic question which they needed answering whether, was whether it contained any subjudice elements. It did not. I have found it impossible to get an answer 25 hours after I tabled this motion as to whether it will be pr uh, printed so that I can uh, air my constituents' grievance and raise it again. I regard it, I have to say, Mr Speaker, as discourteous and incompetent of the table office that they have left this situation in this way on a matter for any Member of Parliament wh whose servants they are. They are not in charge of us, they, they, they serve us. And that being so, Mr Speaker, I ask you, A, to instruct the table office to print my motion, and B, to investigate why some of the people in that table office believe that they have the right to dictate to members of Parliament in carrying out their duties. Order. I'm sorry to learn of the disappointment of the Right Honourable Gentleman and of the sequence of events that he has relayed to the House. However, I hope it will be helpful to him if, on the basis of what I have been advised thus far, I respond. 
I have a duty, I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman and to the House, to uphold the sub judice rule of the House. I note what the Right Honourable Gentleman said about that, but I have something to say. That rule applies equally to written as it does to oral proceedings. I expect the table office to support me in upholding the rule by taking precautions to ensure that there is no inadvertent breach of the rule. It can sometimes take a little time to check whether there are active proceedings in a particular case. I will take steps to assure myself that the Right Honourable Gentleman's motion has been treated no differently than one from any other member would be treated in similar circumstances. However, I stress the importance that I attach to taking all reasonable steps to ensure that the sub judice resolution of the House is abided by at all times. I have been informed by the Table Office that the Ministry of Justice has confirmed that there are no active proceedings and the early day motion of the Right Honourable Gentleman has been tabled. I hope he will understand that I am responding on the basis of what I've been advised. I just want to say one other thing to the right honourable gentleman, and that is that I hope that nobody who works in this House and serves its members would ever suppose that it is his or her role to dictate to members, to rule members, or in any sense to trump members, Everybody is here to serve members, and that should be a matter of pride. I'm genuinely saddened if the Right Honourable Gentleman feels let down. I'm happy to look into the matter further. I don't want the Right Honourable Gentleman to be unhappy, and I hope he'll take it in the right spirit if I just gently add, for his benefit and that of the House, that I am relieved at least that at the point at which he discovered, against his expectations, that his motion had not been tabled, I was not myself anywhere near him. <laughs> well, point of order, Sir Gerald Kaufman. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my courtesy towards you is maximum compared with any courtesy I have to anybody else in this country apart from Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> uh, th that having been said, uh, Mr. Speaker, one would have had to be hypercritical on reading the 120 words of my motion to imagine that it related in any way whatsoever to court proceedings or to sub judice rule. And that being so, Mr. Speaker, what I'm hoping for in future is that the table office will not take upon to themselves rights over what members of parliament have the right to say beyond what you yourself would accept, Mr Speaker. On the same point of order, sir. Well, the role of the table office is to assist the speaker in upholding the rules of the House. I hope that that is widely understood. The right honourable gentleman will understand that I cannot debate this matter further now and it wouldn't be right to do so, but he has made his point very clear. I've heard it. Representatives of the office in question have heard it, and I hope that that will suffice for now. I will keep the matter under close review, and I'm sure that the spirit of what he's been said will be respected. Point of order from a member who arrived in the House first four years before the Right Honourable Gentleman, Mr David Winnick. Well, you made the point, sir, which I wasn't going to make, um, except in passing, perhaps. I have the highest respect for my right honourable friend and he shows the manner in which, having been here for some or nearly 42 years, he is always willing to act on behalf of his constituents. Highly commendable and I don't think as a single member of the House would disagree. But I want to put on record simply this, Mr Speaker. Uh, he, my right honourable friend was highly critical of the table office. Can I say that over the years that I've been here, I've always found them cooperative, courteous, I've never found them at any stage rude, and if indeed I had done so, I would have reported the matter to the clerk of the House or to the Speaker, as the case may be. I look upon the clerks of the House, like the other officers, as dedicated servants of the House of Commons who serve the House of Commons, and I think that should be put on record. Well,
And I appreciate what the Honourable Gentleman has said, and I think that the clerks who serve the House will appreciate it too. Perhaps we can leave it there for today. I'm sure on an entirely separate and unrelated point of order. Indeed. Point of order, Dr Julian Lewis. Uh, on an entirely separate and unrelated point of order, Mr Speaker, I'm sure you will recall the excellent work done by the Leader of the House, who I'm pleased to see on the front bench at this moment, in relation to the question of the demonstrations in Parliament Square. Um, I believe we have freedom of speech in this House, but it does not mean that we have the freedom to shout and bawl our opinions incessantly, whether people wish to hear them or not. I understand that an application has been made to Westminster City Council to reinstate the permission for amplified noise to be used to broadcast for hours on end abusive and hostile political messages at this House in the way that was done to maximum disturbance by the late Brian Hoare, notwithstanding his lawyer's assurances to Westminster City Council when applying for a licence that he would not use it to harass people going about their normal work in this chamber. May I ask, therefore, if you've had any indication uh, of a statement from the Leader of the House as to whether he is willing to make representations to the City Council that no requirement of freedom of speech e enables people to have a right to broadcast at top volume when there is no demonstration taking place political messages which are aimed to disturb people going about their lawful occasions, not least the armed security guards who have to be on constant readiness in front of these Houses of Parliament. Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for his point of order. Certainly no concept of free speech should mean that some people have got a right to shout at the tops of their voices through an amplifier at other people, irrespective of other people's wishes. Uh, the point that the Honourable Gentleman has made seems to me to be entirely reasonable, but the Leader of the House is stirring in his seat, and I feel certain that the House will want to hear what the Leader has got to say. Uh, further to that point of order, Mr Speaker, I share my Honourable Friend's concern. I am planning to respond to the application to Westminster City Council in terms which I think my Honourable Friend would approve of. It sounds as though the Leader of the House might not be the only one, but we're grateful to him for what he has said. Order. Point of order. Point of order, Mr Elfin Cluid. Grateful to you, Mr Speaker. You may have seen over the past few weeks uh, exchanges between the Prime Minister and myself regarding the need for a stalking law. Uh, I did indeed chair a parliamentary inquiry, all parties represented and drawn from both Houses of Parliament. Um, this report, which is evidence-based, has some firm conclusions, has been in the vote office until last week, when last week uh, the authorities said that uh, they should be taken down and not offered to members of Parliament. How, Mr Speaker, can I ensure the widest possible uh, readership of this very important document? I want it read from Tidwaliog to Twickenham, and I think it's vital that it is read by everyone. Where can I uh, display it for, for that use? Grateful to the right honourable gentleman for his point of order and for advance notice of it. As I know the right honourable gentleman, who is an experienced member of the House, will readily understand, the reports of all party parliamentary groups are not official papers of the House. The vote office stocks only official papers or very occasionally other documents directly relevant to a debate which is on the order paper. The Right Honourable Gentleman has said that he wishes to make his report more widely known. Might I politely suggest that he has just very effectively started to achieve his objective? If he wishes to email the said document to all members, I suspect that there will be an eager audience, and for my own part, I will be at or close to the head of the queue. Uh, point of order, Mr Robert Halfon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would you, Mr Speaker, look, at again, look again at the decision by the House of Commons Commission to charge people for going up Clock Tower to see Big Ben? This would cost a family uh, of four up to £60. And are there not other ways of saving money, such as not publishing Hansards and other publications on a daily basis and publishing them online? And will you, will you please look at it again so that we ensure that we are a parliament for the many, not the few? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for the point of order and for, again, his courtesy in providing me advance notice of it. I'm bound to say at the outset that this is not a point of order about proceedings of the House. Nevertheless, he's raised a point in good faith and it warrants a response. It would, of course, I say to the House, be unthinkable to charge members of the public for access to the proceedings of the House or its committees or indeed to meet their members of Parliament. However, what I would say to the Honourable Gentleman and to the House is that clock tower tours are special tours allowing access to an area of the palace which realistically cannot be open to all. The charges agreed by the House of Commons Commission are set at a level which will cover the costs, I emphasise, which will cover the costs of providing these tours, no profit order. No profit will be made. I hope that that reassures the Honourable Gentleman. However, if he wishes to pursue the matter further, my advice to him is that he should, in the first instance, take it up with the Chair of the Finance and Services Committee. A point of order, Mr Toby Perkins. Uh, Mr Speaker, you'll be aware that on the 12th of January this House passed unanimously a motion relating to pub companies that called for the Government to commission a review of self-regulation of the pub industry in the autumn of 2012 to be conducted by an independent body approved by the Biz Select Committee. Uh, now, I've been informed by the Minister responsible, the Honourable Member for North Norfolk, in response to a written question, the Government proposes to ignore the will of the House. Is it in order for the Government to vote in favour of something and then act in entirely the opposite way, Mr Speaker? And can you confirm what is the point in having votable backbench motions if the government are going to agree to one thing in debate and then do the polar opposite afterwards? Yeah. And I'm grateful for the point of order and for notice of it. The question of taking action in these circumstances following or consequent upon a debate and vote is a matter for the government. It is not a matter for the chair. But of course there are other courses open to the honourable member and I know that the table in front of me and the table office will be ready to advise the Honourable Gentleman and unless my eyes have deceived me that is a course of action of which the Honourable Gentleman has already availed himself. I hope that he will persevere with that approach though I feel sure that if he's not satisfied I will hear from him again. Point of order Mr, Point of order, Mr. Chris Bryant. Uh, thank you, Mr <laughs> Speaker, for that endorsement. Um, I don't know whether you still read the Daily Telegraph, but uh, on page four of today's Telegraph it says, Theresa May, the Home Secretary, will announce new rules this week, meaning migrants working in the UK must earn at least £35,000 a year if they want to stay longer than five years. If that is the case, that is a significant change of public policy in this country and something I think all of the House would expect to be announced to this House first rather than to national newspapers. Now, that's bad enough as it is, but tomorrow, as I understand it from two journalists, the Home Office is preparing to have a briefing session for journalists on this policy, embargo, embargoed until Wednesday morning, so that it can appear in the Wednesday newspapers and be discussed on the Wednesday television programmes in the morning before the House of Commons has an opportunity to question ministers. Can you investigate this matter and make sure, Mr Speaker, that ministers at the Home Office are not shy and careless about coming to this House, but come to this House first? We should know, surely, before the newspapers. Yeah. Uh, grateful to the Honourable Member for Ronda. I do read a variety of newspapers. I hadn't read the particular story to which the Honourable Gentleman refers. My response is as follows. Embargoed press briefings are not, I think, a new phenomenon, though they do carry very considerable dangers with them. Secondly, the Government is well aware of my view, reiterated on almost innumerable occasions, that major policy announcements should not be made public before they have been reported to this House by way of a statement or conceivably other suitable means. I will reflect on what the Honourable Gentleman has said about what might be planned for tomorrow, and I would suggest that all potentially engaged in the activity to which he refers should reflect very carefully on it between now and then. I hope that is 
both clear and helpful. Order. Point of order, Julie Hilling. I'm grateful that the Prime Minister has waited to hear this point of order because further to his statement that I'm sponsored by Unite the Union, can you advise me, Mr Speaker, how this untruth can be corrected as I'm not sponsored by Unite and what opportunity will be given to the Prime Minister to correct the record? The Prime Minister, of course. Uh, further that point of order, Mr Speaker, I believe that I was reading something from the Register, which is that Bolton West Constituency Labour Party received £1,250 from Unite, from Unite in 2010, and the Honourable Member registered a donation of £2,250 from Unite in 2010 in the Register of the Member's Interest. Now, of course, if in any way... If in any way I've got that wrong, I'll come back to the House at the earliest opportunity. Yeah. Order. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm most grateful to the Honourable Lady for her... Yeah. I'm most grateful to the Honourable Lady for her point of order, to the Prime Minister for his response to it, and for this opportunity to set out the position. Let me just say this for the benefit of the Honourable Lady and of the House. Whether or not the Honourable Lady is sponsored by Unite, and I emphasise whether or not she is, I'm happy to accept she's not if that is the factual position. I don't know. Whether or not she is, I don't need any help from a junior government whip. He wouldn't know where to start. And there is absolutely... He says he's a senior government whip. Is it... I don't think the Speaker's ever greatly cared about the level of seniority of whips, as far as that goes. But whether or not the Honourable Member is sponsored by Unite, and I emphasise the order, and I emphasise there's nothing wrong constitutionally in our arrangements with being sponsored by a trade union, so it is not an accusation. The matter is not order. I order. The Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Ealing North, is a man of magnificent qualities, but he's in no position to advise the Chair what is or isn't allowed. This is not, repeat not, underlined not for the benefit of the Honourable Gentleman, a point of order for the Chair. And that, as I often say, is the beginning and the end of the matter. The Honourable Lady has put her concerns on the record. Point of order, Mr Robert Halfon. Um, Following my uh, points of order with you, Mr Speaker, on Monday about charges for the clock tower, do you have any information whether or not uh, the members will be given a vote on this very unfortunate decision to charge people to visit the House of Commons? Uh, No, I have no such information and I'm afraid it's not a point of order for the Chair. I've known the Honourable Gentleman for over 20 years, probably nearer to 25, so I know what a tenacious terrier he is. But he must raise these matters in an orderly way. I think we've got his point, he's got my response, and at least as far as today is concerned, we'll leave it there. If there are no further points of order...